and make arguments around topics of a strong international interest. I would especially remark the extraordinary contribution of young leadership in the Institute that is called to produce the next generation of researchers that I'm sure uh, will hold the institution to very high standards in the future. I would also remark the importance of the IFIMAT colloquium series that has brought important scientists from around the globe to also intensify its international projection. Last week, we enjoyed, for instance, the excellent conference by Professor Harosh, Nobel Prize laureate in 2012, organized in collaboration with the Spanish Research Agency and the French Embassy in front of a wonderful engaged audience, I must say. For all these, my congratulations to the steering committee of the Institute and all the scientists involved in the day-by-day -day activity of IFIMAC, and of course, to the organizers of the event ahead that will be surely successful and will help us to learn a little more about novel topics in condensed matter physics. I'll give now the floor to the head of the Institute to introduce the program. Thank you very much. Well, before entering the program, I would like to say explicitly, because the vice dean is here, that uh, the faculty, the science faculty, has been very helpful to IFMAC this year. They have been, I mean, there for us when we uh, come to them with uh, needs for space for our new researches, whatever. So and um, they have supported us in all these conferences and uh, seminars that we organize. So I want to thank the faculty formally here in front of all the institute for this uh, the support that they are giving us. Thank you. Okay, so we have a very intense program today. I think a very exciting one. So I will just go very briefly through them and then I will, we will start. Uh, as you see, um, the first thing after the opening are uh, the talks by IFIMAC junior leaders. For us, IFIMAC, I mean, young researchers has been one of the focus. We have spent a significant amount of uh, the funding that we got from the Maria de Mar to in attracting uh, bright uh, young researchers. And we are going to have today talks by uh, five of them, covering the five research lines that we have at IFMAC. Then it's not only uh, talks, we have a poster session where we can actually um, gather all of us, I mean, both uh, students, postdocs, and senior researchers, and discuss a little bit about the very broad science that we do at IFMAC, covering from quantum materials to biophysics, as we will see. And uh, then there is, uh, before the lunch, another main thing, which is uh, this IFIMAC is more than research. I mean, as a center, we, one of our goals is to go not only to do excellent science, we want to make an impact in our environment, in the, the place where we are. And that means to engage in activities that go beyond research, like uh, gender issues, uh, communications, outreach, and open science. So we'll have presentations by people from IFIMAC involved in these different issues. And uh, so we can become aware of this. Uh, so you can also engage in these things for the future. And then we will have the lunch break, okay? After that, we will have the two talks on uh, junior leaders again. There was a mistake in the program. The chair of that session will be Celia, Celia Polo. And then we'll have something that is new to the IFIMAC day, which is this round table, where we will discuss actually this mysterious thing, this transversal strategic research lines. So uh, what we have uh, realized is that because we have this very broad scope, actually, we don't know much about what other people is doing at IFIMAC. I mean, we know what we have close to us or both scientifically or geographically, but we want to actually if we want to success as an institute, we want to thrive, we really have to exploit this possibility of multidisciplinary work. So this, um, this endeavor goes precisely in that direction. It will try to show how from the different research lines and from the different groups, we can contribute to some strategic lines that we have identified. And actually we have written those lines in our proposal for the new Maria and Mike too, and see how we can contribute to that. So, it's going to be, I think, a very interesting, very interesting time. And to, uh, for the end, we have the closing by the one rector. She's coming back from Brussels today. She's actually landing in Barajas at uh, 2.30. So she expects to make it, uh, unless there is some bad weather and some uh, plane delays. But in principle, we have the, the one rector. 
and also the vice director of scientific policy. So with that, I think I will stop and I think we will move to the first uh, session. I will thank again the vice dean for uh, joining us in the opening. And I now pass the word to Antonio, who is going to chair the first session. Okay, so very briefly, uh, we have three speakers uh, in the morning session. Uh, Pablo Ares, Akasdit Kamra, and uh, Laura Rodriguez, that just arrived with them, yeah, good. So our young researchers, we asked them to give a talk for us on their own research, and also a little bit about their story and how they ended up in, at IFIMAC and what IFIMAC has meant for their scientific career. So, uh, first of all, thank you all for agreeing to, to do this. And with this, I pass the word to Pablo Ares, who is our first speaker. Again, the title of her talk, oh, he's talk already explained. <laughs> the, the title is My Experience as an Ethiopian Junior Group Leader. So, Pablo. Uh, thank you very much, Antonio. Uh, so, thanks for the introduction. Well, it is a pleasure for me being here again in the second IFIMAC day, giving a talk in this case, talking about my experience as a an IFIMAC junior leader. And some of you that probably don't know that don't know me much will be questioning, will be asking, well, how, how this guy is a junior leader? You know, with all this green <laughs> uh, uh, white hair in his head. So the thing is, just to explain that, a brief introduction on, sorry. Yeah on my trajectory. So I got my thesis degree in the computer in 2003, 20 years ago now. And then I was in a company, Nanotech, that was a company that was a spin-off of the autonomous. And I spent there almost 11 years. So that's why I got my PhD after that. And I got my PhD in 2017. So despite my white hair, scientifically, you can say I'm young. Because for those who don't know, this day is the one who, where the clock starts ticking for contracts, for uh, fellowships, for everything. So take that in mind. So, well, after that, I got a PhD, sorry, a postdoc in the University of Manchester, and then I arrived back to the IFIMAC, okay? So I want to stress, because it will be like the main message from, from this talk, some of the of the words of the words that are here in blue, the, the, these keywords like development, uh, collaborations, development again, AFM, advanced modes, communication outreach, words related to 2D materials. So these are the, the topics I have been working on and more stress focused. And I think it's what IFIMAC has given to me, the possibility of doing this work and also to collaborate within many other IFIMAC people. So anyway, I will not talk about these things, but I will talk about what I've been doing here at IFIMAC. Okay, and for this, IFIMAC, I have to thank IFIMAC, both steering committees, previous and past, because giving me this uh, junior leader position, for sure has helped to get projects and other grants and things that otherwise would be would have been more difficult. Okay, so I want to show this uh, virtual cycle because I think it's what has driven my career, it's driving my career toward research and academia. So first I have a strong focus on fundamental science, but for that a lot of, uh, I have done a lot of instrumentation and, and <coughs> development because for many of the things I wanted to do was needed because we had not the tools for that. But also all this has been here with you know, teaching, communication, and outreach, because it's important to give back to the community what the community is giving back. So the, the, the talk will focus on, on this, and also I will go by these three different aspects, but I want to, to highlight, to stress, the collaborative aspect of, of IFIMAC. Okay, and in that sense, I want to first thank more from a technical point of view, this would, this would be a kind of Thanksgiving uh, talk, okay? So <laughs> you will see plenty of pictures around of, of people, so I want to thank all of them, even if I don't mention the names. Probably there are more people to thank that are not in the picture, but you, all of you please feel, feel uh, knowledge. So yeah, all the people with, from a technical point of view that make all this possible, because otherwise this would be quite difficult. And one of the important things of this I think is that uh, we have a lot of help in that sense and a very skilled people to do this. Okay, also, the other thing I want to stress is this collaborative spirit that I think uh, goes very well with my own spirit because I've been always trying to collaborate with people, to help people do things. 
So this is uh, the, the collaborative project talks from last year, if you say, I had the chance to give a talk being part of one of these uh, direct projects, but I also have indirect part on a few other projects. So that's what I'd like to, to thank again, because this will be difficult in other institutions. So again, well, coming back here, I will just start from each of different uh, of these different uh, uh, topics, let's say, and show some of the things I've been doing this year at, at DigiMac. So first, I will start with this instrumentation and, and development. And for this, I will, now it's like kind of collection of things we're doing and thanking the people who is working on this. So we wanted to do a versatile high-speed AFM. We have a lot of experience in AFM. If IMAC, University of Autonoma, has a lot of experience in SPL, we can say after IBM Zurich, we are the second institution in the world with much with, with higher experience in, in scanning Pro because the first is came out of there came here. So we wanted to be in collaboration with, with the group of Pedro and Pablo, a uh, high-speed AFM, but more versatile, maybe not so fast as other commercial AFMs, but allowing different modes, which are not available on usual high-speed AFMs. So we design it, and then we assemble it. So we have it there in the lab, and now, and then we tested it. So first we tested it with a, let's say, easy sample. These are carbon nanotubes that are very robust and can stand whatever conditions. So we just image these carbon nanotubes at one image per second. It's not that fast, but when compared to usual AFM, it's relatively fast. But then we wanted to test some more demanding samples. So that's why also with Pedro, we tested some tobacco mosaic viruses. These viruses are kind of tubular viruses that the, the capsules are, are uh, arranged in this uh, cylindrical pattern and the nucleic acid is going inside like this. We just image them in this high speed, not so high, so you in dynamic mode, but this is more or less the standard. We also image them in jumping mode, which is a, a more uh, Better, let's say a different way to, to scan the samples in which the tip is jumping from point to point, and this allows a precise control of the force. And in this way, we can do these static experiments to see if the virus is in this platform. Okay, so also based on it, somehow in that uh, uh, high speed design, we wanted to use uh, to, develop, to develop a technological uh, atomic form microscope for UHD. Typical UHD, <laughs> UHD systems. Are done in uh, uh, are work in low temperature conditions and they use a CO tip at the end to do sub uh, molecular resolution and well, very uh, difficult things let's say but they are not very versatile we wanted to do like more standard experiments with a let's say beam deflection approach to do force rest of distance cures and uh, to do uh, friction <coughs> adding a clean environment which is typically not possible with the standard UHV system so we took advantage of one UAV chamber that was already in the lab that was uh, used at the time for, for Chema, Jose Maria Gómez Rodríguez, and was not used anymore. So we decided to take advantage of that and design to replace an STM that was in here by the design of uh, an IFM in these conditions. So, <coughs> again, the design we have this design here with the laser for the beam deflection, the autodiode is here, the tip is down there, here is a scanner, transfer system for tips and samples, and so on. And we assembled it, and we have already now first prototype version. You see, these are um, 3D printed parts, so this is just the first prototype for Earth for testing. But now we are replacing these parts with uh, metal parts compatible with UHV. And we have been able to take first images. You see, there is still some uh, stability issues, but we are working on that. But this is HOPG, this is a we have few nanometer terraces, even some of them are atomic scale terraces. Maybe you can see here, but here there is a step which is monatomic, which is this one in here. So despite this stability issue, we, will, uh, we, have, we can now still uh, achieve uh, this atomic uh, scale uh, steps resolution. So we're working in the right direction. Okay, I also, during my thesis also with Pedro, I, I assembled a atomic form microscopy compatible with total internal reflection fluorescent microscopy. And now we are also helping Merce to assemble one of these new ones, but also including the possibility of doing Raman measurements in this same setup. And we are working on that. Okay, from a more, uh, instead of, let's say, uh, the direct instrumentation, but from more from a methodological point of view, we also have been working on developing novel nano electrodes. Okay, we wanted to contact some materials that using the standard lithography techniques was very difficult. So that for that we developed our own technology. So we just got a drop with nanowires, all nanowires, we deposited on the substrate, we blow them away, and now using an AFM tip, we will manipulate these nanowires 
to form nanoelectrodes connecting our devices. Okay? We, we demonstrated this in a publication. We did set different uh, connections to show the possibilities. Um, and also, we use it, we demonstrated that we could make very long paths. So, this was very robust. In this case, to connect several uh, few layer antimony in flakes and to study the electrical properties. Okay, you see here the connections. We use an, an AFMT as a second mobile electrode. So, we, can able, we were able to prove the, the, the electrical behavior with the distance. This is collaboration with Felix and Juan Zamora, the groups, of course. Uh, we, we saw that the, the conduction was, was uh, governed by topologically protected super states. But in any case, you can see here, sometimes there are some, despite this relatively clean compared sometimes to EV that leaves persist uh, contamination and so on, so there are some contamination that we wanted to, to remove. And in order to do that, we have been working on developing another approach in which instead of directly depositing them nanowires on the substrate, we just transfer them from a, from a viscoelastic stamp. So the new approach is the fo as the following. We have this stamp, which is viscoelastic and transparent. We just produce an oxygen, oxygen plasma just to improve the, the visibility for, for, the, for the nanowires. And then we deposit here the nanowires and have the nanowires in here. Okay? We do a second oxygen plasma to remove more contamination. And then we come and transfer them onto our source. Okay, that's why we do this determining the physical transfer. We can place the nanowires exactly where we want. We remove the stamp and we have the nanowires there. Now we can come with the FL tip and position the nick. By doing this, we can get much more cleaner devices. You can see that there is no contamination around. Some nanowires, less nanowires for here, and we can characterize this, this case few layer that you flake and see its properties and, and so on. Okay, we're also having some fun with the graphic masks, working with Felix during COVID times. You remember the Canadian authorities banned some graphic masks because they were saying that uh, they, they were harmful for the people because they were releasing graphene and was uh, breathed by the people. So we were decided to test because they were not test about that. They were saying that without any scientific basis. So we were evaluating and testing these uh, graphene uh, masks in order to see if they were really releasing this graphene. So we uh, they developed a, a system in which we diff make different tests in very harsh conditions to, to, to test this uh, graphene on the masks and see if the graphing was really released. And we, we made several tests, different protocols that we also established a new protocol for this. And finally, we saw that basically graphing was not released. In fact, the, the, the mass will improve themselves. And also, this is an example of the measurement we did, for example, Raman imaging of the fibers of the mask, just as they were, after doing some of these tests and see that the amount of the graphing could be this, this pink spot. The amount of graphing in the, the fibers is basically the same despite all these very fast conditions, which is much more harder than just breathing for a few hours. So we were having fun with this as well. And I will go now for more fundamental science, let's say, in this, this period. And for that, uh, I was working with Rian Juanjo and Cristina, uh, using an approach of using an elephant tip, diamond tip, to apply ultra high pressures on, on our samples. So by doing that, uh, we were able to improve the electrical contrast to fill MOS2, which is a 2D semiconductor, which is now uh, studied a lot to be incorporated into electronic devices in the future. So what we saw is that by using an AFM tip and applying high pressures, we could uh, pass from a semiconductor phase to a metallic phase. And this is shown here with low pressures, like, no, almost no pressure or low pressures, low is actually Pascal's in this case, the behavior of the current versus voltage is like this, and it's a semiconductor thing. And we go into high pressures, you can see that it goes to a linear behavior. This is what was done in the, let's say, transfer configuration and also in plane configuration, and we see the improvement in both cases was, was significant. Also, when I arrived here as a junior leader, I started a collaboration with uh, the group of Mariola Ramirez and Luisa Bausa in order to couple this MOS2, this 2D material, with the ferroelectric substrate. So we have this. Lithium iodide substrate that they can pattern with different uh, ferroelectric domains with the polarization pointing up and down. And again, using this uh, standard transfer techniques uh, for 2D materials, we placed MOS2 flakes on top of this uh, substrate. So we have few layer flakes with monolayer areas just on top of several domains. So they have characterized this optically. And for example, here we have a flake with a one layer, which is on top of different domains with different polarization. And we can see that from the photoluminescence, 
one of the domains is p type doc, the other one is n type doc, so in the end, we have a PM junction in here, which is quite interesting for, for this material. We also check that uh, electrically. We have, the, for example, this, in this case, this other plate in here, also part in one domain, part in another domain, and we just use now a probe station just to put two probes uh, in the sample and measure the transport around along this circuit. Okay, the thing is, these probes here are not the standard probes. They are AFM probes, which are very sharp, and also the, the ones that have the tip just at the end. So we know exactly where we are positioning the tip. So if now do the transport measurement just in the in a similar domain, we just found a uh, kind of expected domain, uh, behavior, the linear. But now if we move that tip on one domain and the other in the other domain, we see this rectifying behavior characteristic for the PN junction. Okay, we are continuing this uh, collaboration with, with San Ramir and Mariola, and we have also uh, been able to, to fabricate some nano lasers. Well, they have been, I almost did nothing, but here. <laughs> so, by combining in this case this substrate with the MOS2 plus, in this case, silver nanoparticles, these silver nanoparticles confine the light in here. The MOS2 works as a saturable absorber, so they, 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 they confine the light and then they shine, they get a pulse of laser. But then this saturates and there is no light and it's it's going up on, on off on off on off and we, we, we get this pulse nanotation. There are some col more collaborations working on going on with we use a, 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 a Mariola, which are we are working on that. Okay, and now one of the probably main research line I'm, I'm working on in, in at IFIMAC is on the static heat transfer of the nanoscale into the materials, and this is done in collaboration with Guillermo Villena, which is here. But also much more people. I mean, Guillermo and all the students, and also more senior people in here, Carlos, Ruben, Feliz, Julio. So basically, what we want to do is okay, if we have a 2D material and we have a hot point and a cold point, how this uh, heat transport will flow from one point to the other. And this 2D material will tell atomically thing. And the relation with the friction and with other parameters. And for that, we will use an AFM tip. So Guillermo will be, and his team will be more in charge in the theoretical aspects of the, the of this measurement, and I will be more in charge of the, of the experimental aspects. We got a TED project uh, for this kind of measurements, and that allows us also to hire people to, to do this work. So, for example, what we want to do from the experimental point of view is to fabricate these uh, constrictions, which are areas narrower in a metallic circuit, so that if we put now a 2D layer on top and we circulate a current, we can see that this part will heat up and this will heat up the 2D layer, producing a heat layer. And if we come now with the FLT, there are special advanced modes in which we can get uh, data related to this temperature change. So, indeed, we have publicated some of this. You see here the constriction, here a few layers of heat plate on top of that. Now, if we pass the current and measure this uh, Joule expansion AFM measurements, let's say, you can see this temperature variation that taking a profile is all of this. So, we're able to measure this uh, temperature variation with AFM. But the thing is, well, okay, fine, what, what we can do with this? So the idea is to study how, for example, a single defect is affected by the heat transport, how a single defect uh, will, will, will modify the heat transport properties of the materials. So for that, we are something that is not known. Uh, we are exploring this, this approach, and also not only from the fundamental aspect, but also in new to do devices, like, for example, thermal diodes, it would be fundamental for economics. Uh, we also want to study what happens with uh, heat transport when having uh, different stacking configurations. You know, Pistronics is now quite trained in 2D materials. So if you rotate one layer of a 2D material on top of the other, different stacking configurations will appear. Okay, so we have, for example, AA, one atom of one kind is on top of the same kind of atom. AB, there is no atom below. BA uh, is the opposite kind. So we have experience in doing this kind of, of devices, but what we don't know is how the heat transport will be affected by these different uh, atomic configurations. And that's something we want to explore because also controlling this standard then will allow to control how it flows on the two materials. Okay, so but you, if you probably you didn't notice because I'm going, going very fast, but the, this profile I, picked up, I painted from the temperature calibration was not in temperature units, it was arbitrary units. So this is a known issue in nanoscale uh, thermometry to, to calibrate temperature in this nanoscale system is not very easy. So there are different approaches. Uh, we have explored some of them. And one of them is to use kind of material 
that it has a transition in a given temperature, so that will give you a fingerprint of the temperature you are at the, at that moment. So some of them are some polymers, we're working on that with the group of ferries as well. But also, for example, we decided to we wanted to use the tobacco mosaic virus. I come back to this with a group of Pedro again, in order to, I mean, these are viruses, these are, these are uh, capsules, these protein lipids, this is biological stuff. We expected it to, to degrade easily at below 100 Celsius, for example. So we just put it, some of them in a substrate, then we put the substrate in an oven, and we heat the substrate and the sample for several minutes at different temperatures, and then we image them in the AFM to see what happens. Okay, and surprisingly, we observe that at room temperature, they were okay, but even at 150 degrees, they look more or less the same. 175, still okay, 200 more or less okay, and it was below, I mean, above 200 Celsius that they started to, to degrade. Okay, and we plot this high variation with temperature, we can see that it's, it's, in a, it's above 200 Celsius that they start to, to, to collapse and degrade. So this will can serve us to put them on our constrictions to see the temperature that we are at this point. But also it's interesting itself because this, all these viruses are studied to be drug delivery carriers or other, uh, other kind of carriers. So if, if they can withstand high temperatures, if they are more robust, this is fine, it's good. So we are, we are working on this as well. Okay, so just very fast. Also from this uh, communication outreach part, if IMAC has been very helpful, always promoting this. So we just want to highlight some of the things like even talks in, uh, in museums, in, in schools, also helping organizing uh, meetings for different, different topics. But also, for example, last week in this, Patricia has a lot of, I mean, all these outreach and communication things, Patricia has a lot of weight, and I want to thank her for his help. We were having uh, activities for, for, for schools in, in the Semana de la Ciencia last few weeks ago. And also, Patricia is doing something called If You Mad Facts on Twitter, well, on X, in which he's, she's posting things on on different things that people you know, inside IFIMAC don't know about other people working in IFIMAC. So trying to, to show the people all the things we do at IFIMAC, uh, she's doing this, this initiative and I'm helping her with the things related to, to the material with the scanning flow and so on. Okay, so just to finish, more acknowledgement of the funding acquired on, on this period. And of course, I want to thank you all of you for your attention. Thank you very much, Pablo. Uh, I think we have two minutes for a question or two or a comment. Thanks, Pablo. Great talk. Um, for the temperature calibration, have you considered using Raman, the, the ratio between Stokes and Yeah, yeah, that's, that's the idea. But the thing is, uh, with the initial heaters we made, sorry, that was that's one of the ideas. The initial heaters we made, uh, that we were thinking that we could reach higher temperatures, but at the end, that sensitivity we saw with AFM is a very good sensitivity. The temperature change was not very high. And in the Raman, we see very slight changes. Now we are doing uh, heaters with um, different uh, geometries. So we can heat more and we expect to see these changes with Raman. Yes. We also have tried with luminescent uh, nanoparticles with Danny Hake. But when placing them on the 2D materials, some of the interaction changed and were not so easy. We are now trying to deposit some polymers that have a known temperature melting. So when heating, they will change, and we will see that with the FM, so we have different approaches. OK, I have one comment myself. I was sitting here next to Carlos, and uh, we both agree on the same comment. Wow, these people do real things. <laughs> so uh, uh, yeah, that means a lot. <laughs> so uh, something that I didn't see is, what about patenting? What about this actual connection to industry? How do you feel about that, and what's your take on that? Um, well, I have a lot of, uh, not discussions, but talks with Felix around about that. Uh, because Felix, he, you know, he's a fan of patenting things. <laughs> a lot of things. I'm uh, not that fan, I mean, I, because I, I really don't like the patenting system, the, the, how it works. I not, have no problem with patenting, but in the end, it's like you have to put a lot of money, a lot of effort to do something that probably, if someone wants to copy, will copy anyway. <laughs> so uh, we can discuss with him later, but I don't know. <laughs> Okay. Well, thank you very much, Pablo, for the very nice talk. And uh, yeah, let's thank him. We move now to our second speaker.
We are we are finding that part of the thing. Okay. So I pass the floor now to Akasdi Kamra, who is going to talk us about key research at IFIMAC opportunities and challenges. Thank you very much. Thanks, Mr. for So, uh, I want to begin by thanking the Fimax Committee for uh, bringing us all together for this day and giving you the chance to speak to you all today. And uh, my, I want to, in this talk, I want to share with you how last year and how dear Fimax has contributed significantly to my scientific as well as personal growth. Okay. And to tell the story, I first should start by giving something of my background, how I ended up here and what trajectory I took. So I have been working in all these places, so where I've been gathering different experiences scientifically and culturally. Uh, I started my studies, I did my electrical engineering studies in India, where I come from originally. Then I, during this time, I had the chance to work uh, in Germany for an internship where I spent three months. <laughs> then in 2011, I started my PhD in theoretical conventional physics at Delft University of Technology with Gary Bauer in Netherlands. A couple of months after my PhD, Gary got a professor position in Japan, so he got delocalized over Japan and Netherlands. So in response, I got delocalized over Netherlands, Japan, and Munich. And in Munich, I worked in the lab of Sebastian Grunwein, where I pretended to be experimentalist, except on the weekends. <laughs> and then I started my postdoc. I spent a couple of years uh, doing my postdoc in Germany in the group of work on Beltic, where I was a homework fellow. And in 2018, I was hired by Q-Spin Center of Excellence in Norway as the senior scientific staff, where I actually have had a permanent contract. And then I packed my bags, uh, put on a face mask, and I moved to IFIMAC in 2021. So despite having a permanent contract in Norway, I have to mention what attracted me to join IFIMAC. So there are many, many reasons. I'll just highlight three or four, maybe two or three. So the most important reason for me was the excellent researchers here, the extremely diverse topics, and every topic has experts in it. So I, I was really looking forward to the opportunity of learning from all and also working together with all. And then, of course, there is a, most of you know, there's a Spanish system of Ramani Tapal, which means you get a tenure track position, so you can really have the track to uh, become permanent and eventually professor. So that's also what attracted me here. And uh, I also enjoyed the opportunity that I would have here and I did have here to contribute to the institute and also shape the environment here. And finally, but also very importantly, I got a significant amount of budget from IFIMAC to actually come here and start my group. So as expected, as I was hoped, I did benefit greatly from talking and collaborating with a lot of people. Uh, Carlos here taught me a bit of the quantum optics. Uh, from Johannes and Nefekota, I learned a little bit about polaritons. Um, from Nefekota, I also learned about uh, excitons and so on. Uh, with Saul and Farka, I don't see them here, so eventually it's always uh, working. So uh, from Saul, with Saul and Farka, I could uh, work together on some experiments in magnetism. So it's, it's been very uh, beneficial and fun working together. In addition to these collaborations, I did not have the space to show photos, but I have had the privilege to receive mentorship from uh, in, from several people, but in particular, I would mention Efehota and Antonia, actually. So it's been really a privilege to get the, the guidance that I have gotten here, but also from Paloma here and also Perka. So it's been, uh, yeah, that, that I appreciate the most, I would say. And the, the decent amount of money that Ifima kindly gave to my group allowed me to actually establish a group and import people uh, from abroad. So Sebastian was a bachelor's student. He was not paid, you know, his uh, 
labor without paper. Okay, because it's learning. So that's another batch of the students. These are not actually paid for my group, but these three were hired using the budget that IFIMAC provided me, and uh, Louisa eventually got her own funding, so uh, she doesn't cost me anything at all. And all the group members were able to make significant contributions to the group and the research, but also to IFIMAC and to the scientific community. Their works are fall in the in three different directions. So spin transport, quantum magnetics, and unconventional superconductivity. These are the three broad topics that we pursue in the group. And uh, I will, due to the limited time we have, I will not have the chance to speak about everything. So I'll just focus on one of these. I will just tell you, introduce a little bit about what is quantum magnetics. And in the process, I will simply motivate the work that Anna Luisa, together with Carlos and Alejandro, uh, has carried out at FMI. Okay, I will not tell you about that work, but just motivate it so you can go to the poster. All right, so this field started relatively recently. And, and, and what I do here is I take a very specific and narrow perspective designed to motivate Anna Luisa's work. So if you want a broader overview, I would recommend uh, these two articles because I see a bit biased because they represent my own perspective. Okay, so let's consider two spins, let's say spin halves, which are antiferromagnetically coupled. This is the Hamiltonian. And to minimize energy, they would want to be in the opposite directions. So I can either they can either have this configuration where the red is up, blue is down, or they can have that contribution with the red is down and the blue is up. This is what classical physics allows. But when you actually solve the problem, you realize in quantum mechanics, a uh, superposition of these two states is what lowers the energy. So this is called a spin singlet. Okay, so this has uh, the lowest energy. Yes. So we can have uh, we can have either a state like this, which is People call a classical state an ordered state for the simple reason that it's there's no superposition. And the true ground state is given by this, which is a spin domain. And uh, one prominent feature of this is, this is an entangled state. So if I have this state, when I make a measurement in the first spin, if the spin is up, then the second spin would be down. And if I find the spin to be down, then the second spin will be up. So in that sense, it's an entangled state. I can schematically represent in this manner. And what I want to show why this schematic is uh, first thing that the expected value of spin is zero at both places. That's why people call it sometimes call it quantum disordered. It just means that there is we don't expect an actual spin at any point, it will be zero. Okay. On the other hand, in this set, we call it ordered, or some people call it classical, I dispute that, but anyhow, ordered state. Okay, these are two couple spins, but uh, you rarely find two spins. We, we have, when you come to actual solid, it's a macroscopically large number of spins all coupled together, and let's consider one of solid with anti ferromagnetic couples. Then the ground state, one can imagine as forming these pairs where the spins occur in superpositions. But this is, so here, this, this kind of uh, Ellipse indicates that on this edge is one spin, and this edge is the other spin, and these are in superposition as shown here. But that's not actually the ground state either. The ground state has a quantum superposition of all such bonds. So here I just show spins which are adjacent to each other, forming an entangled state. But on this side, I show that the spins can also have long range. So this spin can form such a state with a spin which is far away, and that comes with long range entangled. Uh, this is actually what Phil Anderson proposed in the year I was born, uh, and he called it resonant, uh, resonating valence bond state. Okay, so this state was K arose in the context of explaining high PC superconductivity in Kubernetes, and that thing started the whole field of quantum and liquids. But in addition, people just jumped on the opportunity to see that there is entanglement. A long range entanglement in many body states that arises due to the fundamentally fermionic or bosonic nature of the species in there. 
And in addition to using entanglement as a property that is a purely, so, you know, when you look at systems, you, you talk about what is the specific heat capacity of the system or what is the charge density, something like this, right? So entanglement entropy or entanglement emerged as a new quantum property that characterized certain good features of the system. In addition to just theoretical interest, people start to speculate and be excited about the fact that we can have entanglement in ground state without doing anything, and maybe we can use it, we can extract it for quantum computing purposes. So that is the plan. Well, what's the plan? And it still is the plan. So clear. Step one, find the state. Step two, characterize it. Step three, develop experimental methods to actually uh, use it for quantum computing, and then you know, happy day ever after. So if somebody went to the lab, or somebody should probably say, "No, so I will go to the lab and try to uh, measure the antiferromagnet." But when you actually measure, it turns out it looks more like this. It looks more as the classical ordered state, which is called the male ordered state. So something strange has happened, and there is a setback. Keep in mind that even Phil Anderson, when he proposed the resonating valence bond state, he proposed it to explain the high TC superconductivity in cuprates. And it has been quite successful in explaining that. And even that people will dispute, but it's a matter of, in, in this field, that's really a, a question of who you ask. Okay, so now we are, we are faced with a, a challenge. We start with the same Hamiltonian. The, Proper quantum mechanical theory tells me that it should be a quantum disordered system, not showing any kind of spin structure. <coughs> but when I go to the lab, I find this order. And in particular, a lot of the experiments, like if you, you, you have antiferromagnets in, in normal technologies, and there all the theoretical work has been developed assuming such a state. So this makes no sense. Like physics is not supposed to be like this, it's consistent. So what's really happening here? <clears throat> so let's try to make a very oversimplified picture for this. So the real life is complicated, always. So what we did is we started to start working with this Hamiltonian and we tried to capture the quantum properties of the system. And here I represent <laughs> in this shape, the quantum property as an edge, as a corner. So we tried to make the most simple model or the most simple wave function where all the emphasis was on the edges. So we use the simplest possible shape to form the edges. On, on this side, people tried to also form a simple possible shape, but that was a circle, so no edges. So this side overemphasizes the quantum features entanglement. This side ignores everything quantum in it. The reality is somewhere here. It's a bit difficult, but it, it, it's somewhere here. So when people could not find this quantum spin liquids, or there are a lot of efforts, I, I will not go into details of the, the, the status of quantum spin liquids, but since people struggle, it's been more challenging to find quantum spin liquids, people start to work from this. Let's start with this, try to add some more complications and understand how we can go a bit more towards this direction. Okay, this has been ongoing for almost 50 years now. However, for more than half a century, people did not try to examine whether can I start with a purely classical state and then try to understand if I allow for quantum features and capture those things over there. And that is one of the perspectives which quantum magnetics brings. So magnum is an excitation of an ordered state. And in this way, people decide to work on capturing the quantum <coughs> features in magnets that are in our industrially relevant devices and everything. Uh, last five, six years, people have succeeded in explaining a lot in this technology, people in this theoretical methodology, people showed how high TC superconductivity can emerge, how entanglement entropy is the same as from this side and many more. But what came out as a surprise and even more advancement is that nobody expected, not talk about any kind of magnets, right? But nobody expected ferromagnets to have any quantum features or entanglement. And, and uh, but that was revealed on this perspective that even ferromagnets have those, and this is what uh, Ana Luisa has done. 
All right, so let me yeah, still have time to come on five minutes. Five minutes for me. Okay. So a pharaonic dance just looks like this. I create one excitation by flipping one screen. And that I can see as a screen H by a maximum, which has been superimposed upon the ground state. Now, if one considers only a uh, Zeeman energy and exchange interaction, such a screen H by a maximum, delocalized over all space, constitutes a maximum. So, to get my wave function notation straight, uh, this represents an absence of maximum, so fully ordered ferro magnet. This is one magnum, two magnum, and so on. And for simplicity, so this is how the ground state looks like. And for simplicity, let me focus on the total spin in the system. And so I get a big arrow along the z direction, and I can represent that in the phase space along in the sx and sy axis where this dot. Okay. But this is forbidden by Heisenberg uncertainty principles because sx and sy are two non commuting observables. They cannot have zero time fluctuation. So the real picture emerges and that's like this. So we have the Heisenberg uncertainty region. Still, the ground state is just this one. But what happens if I include an anisotropy in the system so that the spin, once you, is, is it, it costs more energy to have spin along the y direction compared to the x direction? And to minimize energy, the Heisenberg uncertainty region deforms and it takes this elliptical shape. And this is, is described by such a quantum superposition of magnet numbers which is formed purely by energy minimization. And very conveniently, this is related to the original ground state or the magnum vacuum, while there's something called a squeeze operator, which comes from quantum optics, and uh, it becomes simple language. Okay, since I'm running low on time, I will skip a little bit of this part because it's not too important. If we had time, we would try to cover all of this, but uh, we do not have the time. So let me come directly to what the challenge is. I argued by energy minimization, we have a state which is a quantum superposition of magnitude. <coughs> now, in all of quantum computing and everything, we can always talk about, if you, if you really look through all the scientific literature or even popular science, we talk about superpositions, but always superposition between two eigenmodes. But here, we are talking about an eigenmode which is formed from a superposition of states, which is a physical basis. To, my, to the best of my knowledge, this, is not, uh, this has not been said before. And this is also important if you want to extract entanglement out of a system and use it for quantum computing, uh, well, if you want to go beyond the eigenvalues. So this is, this is the problem statement that uh, we were interested in and uh, okay, mathematically, let me see the math. And eventually, the team here led by Ana Luisa has uh, kind of addressed this problem, which constitutes a decisive step forward towards harnessing the equilibrium entanglement that exists in magnetic systems. All right, so I will not do more here. And in the couple of minutes that I, I, I still, I hope I still have, I want to talk about how Ethermac has contributed significantly to my personal development and I want to say it at the outset the last two and a half years have been the the fastest personal growth for me to, so far in my life. So life is full of failures and challenges, at least for me. I don't know you have a better than me probably. <laughs> so they have there a lot of failures, a lot of challenges and if we take the time to learn from them and process them adequately, I think you become better people. So in that spirit, there, there have been plenty of uh, failures for me. And, uh, you know, I've failed uh, numerous times. But the good thing is I was able to pick myself up with a lot of help from you. So these, the, the list is long. Okay, I don't I don't pretend that these are only things that I have. The list is really long. I will not go in. So while, while these are my personal failures, and the failures are completely my own, after these, I got immense help from many people here to process and learn from them. And that was really great. And similarly, there are a lot of challenges, you know, we all are facing a lot of challenges here. And even with these challenges, you know, Albudena and many other people are constantly helping me. Everyone goes beyond the call of the duty to just make things easier for me. So it's really appreciated. But let me make it more quantitative. You know, I can publish papers on this, but I can try to make it a little bit more quantitative on how, uh, what, what I have learned from this, okay? A couple of examples. 
So every time you fall, you know, you have to find the time to pick yourself up. But I, I, I realized that my pickup time has been uh, decreased over the last year. So it's, uh, I no longer spend time being upset, like maybe 10 minutes, I no longer spend time being upset and being <laughs> feeling sorry for myself. It's on to the making efforts in the productive direction. So you know, what can I do better? That's it. I definitely have become a much better managing uh, at managing my time. So it's definitely more efficient now and it's, it's been getting better. So that also makes me very happy. I got the chance to teach in English. I just finished my last lecture yesterday and I could connect with the students. I felt very happy about that as well. And it's very nice. And finally, I want to comment on that it has truly been, it's been truly inspiring to see so many of you contribute to the environment and the community and going beyond what's expected out of just the job. So this is many people in official capacities on, on the different committees, but also most people just acting behind the scenes. And, and it really inspires me to do more and better in respect to my contribution. So I, I, I hope to keep learning from that. In the modern civilized world that we live in, there are no real villains, at least in here. Yeah, nobody's blowing a building, there's no joker with a knife to your mouth. So. And the villains are the challenges that we face as a community, which do make our life miserable at times. So you know, those are the villains. But then the modern heroes in the, in the process are the people who actually solve those challenges. And these challenges can be purely scientific, like uh, Luisa is solving the you know, scientific challenge of entanglement. But these challenges are also practical, which are facing the community much more. And not just our senior members, but also our younger members, students and postdocs have been contributing significantly to addressing these challenges. Uh, so I want, to, I want to show this slide so I can encourage my younger colleagues, my students and postdocs to find the challenge that fits you and solve it and be the Batman or the cat from my <laughs> So that's why I want to show this slide, but I also want to show this slide so we can look at this God's photo from the 60s. <laughs> this is what we have on the Institute dust page, no, on the, on the bottom dust page. <laughs> so I'm ready to start my talk now. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I want to end by saying that most of the times, opportunities and challenges appear as indistinguishable to the group. Thank you. Thank you a lot. Thank you very much, Akash, for the beautiful, inspiring, and scientifically solid talk. So again, question, comment? Yeah. Thank you very much for the talk, very nice. Uh, I'd like to ask you if there is any way to estimate from the theoretical point of view the coherence time of these uh, entangled states, you showed that before? Yeah, so this is, this is <laughs> So this is a new very interesting issue. We have one paper together with collaborators from Netherlands where we estimate the coherence time at uh, a few microseconds at temperature one Kelvin. So this depends very much on the system in particular, but uh, coherence time is not extremely important here for the reason that this is equilibrium entanglement or some people call it dissipated entanglement. So if it's stabilized, so the coherence then starts to act only after you have transferred this to an external system. But we have estimated the coherence and theoretically at the moment, experiments are still in progress. Okay, any other question? Yeah. Uh, yeah, thank you. Maybe you, I mean, you need frustration to show the right? In which particular system do you, are you thinking? So the quantum in liquid example, I think I think of this was a prosperity system because in the prosperity system the, the quantum fluctuations are larger, but the fundamental theorem, so-called Marshall's theorem, says that any anticoronagnet by bipartite with the handle turn and short should have a quantum liquid state. So uh, in my case, I consider a bipartite system. Right. So it is by now, <coughs> over the last 15 years, it's well established that to actually be able to see this quantum in liquid state. You, it will be beneficial to have frustrated systems. So that's why the experimental search focuses on them. But when Anderson came up with his theory of resonating wellness bond, he was talking about footprints, which are just simple bipartite systems. There's no frustration there. Okay, I think uh, 
We finish here. Let's thank again Akash for the very nice talk. And our third and last speaker of the session, sorry, I don't know where, where to stand, sorry, I'm moving on the time, is uh, Laura Rodriguez Arriaga. She's going to talk us about vesicles, a powerful model to understand subcellular, cellular, and multicellular organization and dynamics. Thank you, Antonio, for the introduction, and also to the rest of the organizers for the opportunity to share some of the work done in our group. And I'm going to be talking about my favorite software object, those are vesicles, and trying to show you how they can be used to understand a little bit on the physics of subcellular, cellular, and multicellular organization, and likely dynamics. So a vesicle is just this aqueous compartment that you have over there that is separating this water uh, phase from the surrounding aqueous medium by a very thin membrane. This membrane has a bilayer structure because these molecules are amplified. They have two functionalities, hydrophobic regions and a hydrophilic part. So if these amplifiers have shapes that approach a cylindrical shape, by the competition between two entropic forces, they will self-assemble into that structure. The forces in competition will be the hydrophobic attraction that are uh, just bringing the two <laughs> hydrophobic regions together to avoid conducting the water, and there will be some steady repulsion at the level of the head, so that these structures fight a minimum in energy at an optimal packing area, A0, around which these membranes behave elastically. And this structure, this bilayer structure, is the same as you all have, you know, yourself, in all the organelles surrounding your cells. And let me tell you something else. There is nothing apart in a cell, farther apart in a cell than 10 nanometers away. So cells are fully packed with membranes, and these membranes are really important in many biological processes. But if you want to use these structures as model systems, uh, you cannot rely on self-assembly because of this very simple thermodynamics that they told you, the aggregates you get are very polydispersed in size. You can also get multilamellar structures over there. And when working with mixtures, they will be really uh, also compositionally polydispersed. So instead of using self-assembly, what we do is to direct the assembly of these molecules using double emulsion drops as templates. A double emulsion drop is just a water drop inside an oil drop, all surrounded by water. And when you put amplifiers in this oil, they will be forced to set a sample into a structure like that, very monodispersed in size, uh, when the solvent is removed. And we can make these templates in a very controlled way using the advancement of microfluidic technologies. The simple microfluidic device that you can build will be made from a cylindrical capillary in which you can make a very narrow tip, and you can insert that capillary into a squared section capillary just to make a very simple microfluidic chip. Then you will push an inner fluid through this capillary and a second fluid through the interstices between these two capillaries. And at, the, at this step, there will be again a competition between two forces, the interfacial tension holding the drop at the tip and the drag force coming from the outer fluid that will be pulling the drop downstream. Our device is slightly more complicated than that because we need to make double emulsion drops, but the mechanism is essentially what I just told you. And with that, we are making these templates at typical velocities of 10 uh, of a thousand per second. So we make thousands of vesicles in seconds, and later we can use them as very controlled model systems to uh, study biological processes. So one key thing on this technology is also uh, that you do not rely on self-assembly for encapsulating things, but you can put inside these vesicles 
each molecule that you want to be confined in such a structure. <laughs> so let's see some of the biological processes that we are interested in. In cells, it has been recently discovered that we do not only have organelles like Golgi or mitochondria that are surrounded by membranes, but there are also liquid-liquid phase separations inside the cell. They are called membraneless organelles. This is an example, pig granules, that they are dynamically active in this cell. And what they do is they are able to separate metabolic and signaling fruits, even if this is just a phase separation. They know they are liquid because they are shared by fluids, and eventually we can observe coalescence events of these structures. And in polymer or chemi um, in chemistry, we have known for a long time that if we just put two distinct macromolecules in a water solution, these molecules will differ significantly in molecular weight and chemical nature. At a high enough concentration, they will phase separate into two phases. Uh, and the typical phase diagram of that will have a binodal curve separating the single phase region from the two regions, and then a tie line, several tie lines, that will relate the overall composition of your mixture to the composition of each of the phases. So these type of systems have been incorporated in vesicles to make a model, a cytoplasmic model, inside these structures. But their approach was, was to rely on self-assembly, so they just make vesicles self-assemble inside an homogeneous solution, then decrease temperature, go to the next stage, and the structures that you get will have sometimes these liquid problems. But you can have fun with these systems, but they are not really controlled. So we saw an opportunity to contribute with our technology over there. And this is work done by Berta. What she did was to encapsulate with very nice control one of these mixtures of polymers in the single phase region, and then apply osmotic spray stress, so a higher osmolarity of non-permitting solutes in the alter solution. So she's moving towards the two-phase region. And in there, you can make in a very controlled manner this aquasocus phase separation in some <laughs> geometricals. And this is a method for the rapid determination of phase diagrams, not only because the kinetics of this phase separation is really accelerated due to the smaller volume and larger available area in these compartments, but because we, you can reduce as well the number of samples and volume needed for each determination. To determine a phase diagram, you have just to encapsulate several mixtures, apply osmotic pressure, and by the thermodynamics of the system, you will force every composition to lie on the same island, just imposing this external osmotic pressure. And then by changing osmotic pressure, you can make one of these mixtures to move from island to island. So this is what we need for a standard uh, system, PEH and Dextran. Our results show now is agreement what was measured in the lab. So now we have a new technique uh, to quickly measure these trace diagrams. We are more interested in the dynamics of these systems. So I'm going to jump to another project in which we introduce more dynamics. So in a different, uh, we also use these vesicles uh, to mimic cell motion. We are interested in cell motility. Cells use many receptors and ligand interactions to move on substrates. So just inspired by the rolling motion of leukocytes on vessels that you can see here even in a living organism, uh, what Paula is working on is to making our vesicles active. We call them motilosomes because they are going to be able to translate on substrate. And how we do that? We encapsulate a single ferromagnetic particle with our technology inside one of these structures. And in a typical experiment, we will be uh, externally driving the rotation of these particles, just they are just following a rotating magnetic field, and through friction with the substrate, they are translating. Inside the vesicle, the particle is also translating, performing a circular motion inside the vesicle, and the vesicle is translating also as a consequence of friction with the substrate. How this work? So the idea is a particle close to a substrate, <laughs> in a fluid, rotating clockwise, will be moving 
forward. This is because of the shear with the substrate. Uh, but when you confine the particle now inside the vesicle, what we observe is that at the same plane than the particle, the particle encapsulated is moving in the opposite direction than a free particle. This is because we are now changing the fluid field inside this structure due to confinement. And now it is this pressure field which is overcoming the shear that typically drives the motion of the particles. These are numerical simulations uh, solving the Ocean tensor with an approximation in the near field. And with that, we have very nice agreement between the data we get from our numerical simulations that are here in orange and what we measure in our experiments. Here I'm showing a linear relationship between the velocity of the particle inside this structure as a function of the confinement ratio. And there is also a linear relationship between the velocity of the particle and the frequency that is achieved in, by the vesicle, and the rotational frequency achieved by the vesicle. And this is in the case of, I want to acknowledge in here that I forgot, uh, collaborations with Rafa and also with his student, Pablo Palacios, although I didn't put their simulations in here, that are also in nice agreements. Uh, and Paula did these simulations in collaboration with Alfredo Alexander Tat at MIT. And what I was showing you is when the memory is solid, it's behaving as a rigid body that is able to rotate. Uh, and you can see that these memories are solid because when we apply the osmotic stress, these capsules will buckle. But we are more interested in fluid-like materials because membranes in biology are more fluid and they are able to perform these shape thermal fluctuations that you are doing there. The behavior of this system when we have now a fluid membrane is very, very different. Over here, what you may be able to see is that the particle motion inside this structure is no longer showing a constant velocity, but the velocity is larger when it is at the top than when it is at the bottom plane. And this makes our structures not to move now with constant velocity, but is plateauing at some <laughs> points. So just in the numerical simulations, what you may see is that this is the simulation of the fluid field for a solid capsule. Now, if the membrane is fluid, and we do not allow it to rotate, like in the solid rigid case, you get a completely different fluid flow inside that is accommodating the things uh, that we see, but still we are figuring out this system. And we have so many vesicles, we can produce them very easily. So the next thing is that we may be able to self-assemble that in, into a tissue-like material. So also taking inspiration from nature, in a thylakoid membrane, there are very nice correlations between aggregations on the membrane and intermolecular forces between two bilayers. So inspired by that, you can see it uh, here in a much closer look. Inspired by that, what Berta is also doing is to look for interactions that allow us to adhere vesicles and now use these vesicles as building blocks to build new materials. So we find out that the streptavidin uh, interacts uh, non-specifically with PEP. And now we can adhere our vesicles to a glass slide. This is what's going on over here. Uh, the streptavidin will be covering these structures. This is what you see in green, while the polymer membrane is labeled in red. And they will spread on the substrate to make these vesicles that now are adhered to the substrate. So imagine putting here now our uh, motor and see how this addition affects the motion and all the things like that. But also in the context <laughs> of assembling C2, uh, we tested the capacity of this protein to bring two uh, vesicles together. And what you can see is that from a soft junction, they go into a tight junction. And um, what is going on by the end of the process is that all the protein is depleted from the region in between the membranes, and there is a reorganization at the level of the membrane that we think that two layers are becoming one. 
Uh, I'm not going to go into much detail, but we perform molecular dynamic simulations also to complement this experimental work. What we do find, as we are still analyzing data, is that the protein makes favorable contact with this hair group and induces curvature. <clears throat> and this induction of curvature is likely uh, helping and this addition process that we are still in the process of analyzing. So we are making larger materials, yes, by making them fuse with the <laughs> strategy. After six hours, the materials look like that. And where do I want to go is that now we have great control over the building blocks. You can have phase separations in the membranes, phase separation inside, different actuation protocols because we can make them rotate or even actuate them and their electric fields. And using this as building blocks and changing the interactions, I have a lot of capacity to build new materials with novel emerging properties. So hopefully they will become active and we'll see some new behaviors. So in these last minutes, I just want to share, uh, not the science, but the part of how is my GMAC experience. I didn't prepare a slide, but I was here on January 2020 with Ana Monica Hall. And my contact person was Pedro Tarazona, that was super kind and made everything very easy. So at that time, the director was FJ. So finally, I decided to get here and got um, individual help to start up uh, my lab. And later, I was very lucky as well because uh, we was funded in the collaborative project that is uh, collaborative with Juan Luis, or the projects are with Juan Luis because we have a joint group that is over here. Uh, and Jose Vicente and Salvatore, and it's been a great experience to work with them. Especially, I want to acknowledge Jose Vicente because he's coming to every group meeting and giving us a new perspective on all that we do lately. Uh, so, being at IFIMAC also helps to get other projects going. And uh, so, uh, in collaboration with Alfred Alexander Tat from MIT, we had a La Caixa MIT Spain seed fund that allowed him to come and spend the summer here with us. And also Berta and Paula that were in the presentation to go there and you and learning things all was thank you to, to IFIMAC. So uh, the reason I decided to join is that in here there are great people doing uh, soft matter. So, uh, I wanted to be there with them. And before I forget, I also want to acknowledge uh, Instituto Nicolás Cabrera because, in fact, our lab spaces are over there. And since January 2020 that I joined, now we have three functional labs. You can go any day and we'll give you a tour. And uh, we have a web lab that many of you know. There is where our microfluidic setup is. We have an optics room in which we have Magneto, that one and other members of the group built and we use in every experiment. And we also have our own confocal microscopy to take all these images that I'm showing. And recently, we also have an interfacial shear re-ometer. So if someone is interested also in interfacial biology, all that is available. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Laura. Again, we have this is a little open for questions or comments. A couple of minutes. Yeah, no problem. Thanks, Laura. So I miss what is the typical size of your vesicles and what, what is the particle it, it that is. you that you put inside? What kind of particle? I didn't say the particle. Ah. The particle is a microparticle, is about eight micron, the one that I show, but we can change it between two terms, something like that. And the vesicle uh, typically is uh, 40 micron in diameter, but uh, this uh, confinement ratio that I explained very quickly, or I didn't, I don't know. Uh, 
this confinement ratio that you have. Sorry. This confinement ratio is actually the ratio of the particle to the vesicle radius. So we are varying it between 0.1 and 0.4. So it's 10 times larger or... Oh, thank you for the nice talk, Laura. So I have a question, maybe naive question about which kind of biological process can you mimic with your experiments? I mean, just, just uh, so we are trying to under, we are trying to understand some fundamental physical principles that can be playing a role in the biological process. I am not mimicking any particular uh, biological process, so I think there is a difference between finally biophysicists and soft matter physics. Uh, so I, I don't have a specific biophysical system in mind, but like to explore fundamental principles that could be playing a role in biology. And then the last question here. Yeah. Hello, Thank you very much for the talk. So I have a question. So this, someone tried to put this uh, <clears throat> magnetic vesicles or magnetic uh, particles inside the real cell and then introduce flow and see how this flow may affect, for example, gene expression or any other biological because I think this is something that could be, that we could try. Awesome. We have that in mind uh, for a while. We have been talking about that, how to hack a cell, a real cell, but we do not have any experience in capturing cells. So this is something that we should talk because your cells are really big. So that would be ideal. We don't know that this has been done. So, good. Okay, let's thank Laura for the very nice talk.